Hello and welcome to AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 1, Part 2. Let's talk about the criminal justice process. Now, the criminal justice system consists of the parts or agencies that make up the overall system. And we went over that in Part 1 of this lesson, the police, the courts, probation, corrections, parole. Uh, however, the criminal justice process is different. The process consists of the activities that members of the criminal justice system engage in to accomplish their goals. These major activities or processes are investigation and arrest, pretrial activities, adjudication, sentencing, and corrections. Let's talk about investigation and arrest. Now, arrests are made by the, which part of a system? By the police, either reactively or proactively. And by the way, when I say police, I'm talking generically. This could be local uniform police officers. This could be state uniform police officers. These could be detectives. Uh, these could be federal law enforcement agents, right? They're all generically police. So these arrests by the police are either reactive or proactive. A reactive arrest is one that is made in reaction to, in response to a crime being committed. Most of the time a crime is committed, the police aren't there and they get a call, 9-11, and they arrive. Uh, if the perpetrator is there, they'll arrest the perpetrator on the scene, or if he's nearby, they may be able to locate and arrest him in that situation. Uh, occasionally, police might be driving down the street and actually see a crime occurring. That would also be a reactive arrest. The key word here is that the arrest takes place totally independent of the police, and they're informed or stumble upon it, and they react to this by going and making an arrest. Now, some arrests are also proactive. And a proactive arrest is one where the police initiate or do something that causes the crime to be committed, and then they arrest the person. Uh, the most uh, common example of a proactive arrest would be uh, a police buy and bust. Uh, a police officer dresses like a drug addict, goes on the street, pretending to want to buy drugs, find somebody uh, that the officer thinks is a drug dealer and says, hey, I want to buy some drugs, you know, here's my money, can you sell it to me? And if the person does, they bust them, they arrest them. That is a buy and bust. And there are many other types of police undercover operations also. Uh, so that would be a proactive arrest because it was actions on the part of the police that created the arrest. Now, most arrests result from quick on-scene investigations by uniformed police officers. Most of the time, the police get to the scene, they speak to a witness of the victim, he went that way or there he is, and they lock up the person. When on-scene units do not make an arrest and the case is serious enough, then detectives do a follow-up investigation and they may, they, they may later make an arrest. Now, if it's a minor crime and no arrest is made, the detectives aren't contacted. But if it's a serious arrest, sometimes they'll be called directly to the scene, like a murder or a rape or something like that. Uh, other times, they might be assigned the case the next day. When I was a detective sergeant, uh, one of the first tasks I had when I came in, if I was working the day shift, was to look at all of the crime reports from the night before. And if I thought any of them were serious, and there was sufficient information to suggest that there were leads that detectives could follow to identify the perpetrator, I would then assign those particular cases to detectives. If they weren't serious, or even if they were serious, but there was no witnesses, nobody saw anything, then I usually would not assign anyone because it would just be a waste of, of time. So again, most arrests, on-scene investigations by uniform cops, serious crimes, assigned to detectives, hopefully their investigation will result in a follow-up arrest. Now, subsequent arrests may be made under the authority of a warrant. Now, a warrant is a judicial order, comes from a judge, directing a law enforcement officer to perform a particular task. 
the most common warrants are arrest warrants and what do you think? Search warrants. Police officers have to convince judges that they have what level of knowledge to believe that criminal activity has occurred in order to get an arrest or a search warrant. Do they have to convince a judge that they reasonably suspect somebody committed a crime or there's contraband in that house? Or do they have to have probable cause to believe? Well, the answer is probable cause. Uh, if you're going to arrest somebody, take away their freedom, or you're going to search somebody or their property, the courts generally require that you have probable, well, that you always have to have probable cause to justify that. And if you have time, you usually are required to run that info by a judge and get a warrant. Now, this really actually doesn't apply to arrest situations. Even though the Fourth Amendment says you're supposed to get an arrest warrant, for some reason, historically, the courts have never required police officers to get arrest warrants. Even if it's a follow-up investigation for a crime that took place weeks before, once the detectives or the police get probable cause to believe that person A did it, they can arrest that person without an arrest warrant. But for search warrants, you, you have to get a court order. Uh, you can search somebody immediately uh, upon arresting them without a warrant, but that's because you're doing it to protect evidence from being destroyed, um, uh, because that might the person may try to destroy the evidence if you had to wait for a judge to get an arrest warrant. And you're also searching the person to protect yourself if you're the police officer from injury. The person might have a knife or a gun and has to be searched for that also. But in other situations, if, if the crime occurred a while back, you generally have to get a search warrant unless you can reasonably uh, articulate to a judge later on that uh, had you taken the time to leave and talk to a judge and come back with a warrant, either the person would be gone or the contraband or evidence would have been destroyed. So again, that's search warrants. Now let's move into the next step in the process, and that is pretrial activities. Uh, and the first one of these is booking. After a person is arrested, they are booked. Booking consists of photographing, taking the fingerprints, and identifying information of a person who's arrested. So again, you photograph the person, you take their fingerprints, and you put all sorts of information, name, address, height, weight, tattoos, identifying information. That's called booking. And it is believed to come from an early practice uh, going back hundreds of years ago and up until uh, fairly recently. In fact, many jurisdictions still do this. When a person's arrested, the police officer brings it back to the police station. And that information in very short summary form is recorded in a big book at the police desk called The Blotter. Uh, that's a book that records all the summonses, all the arrests, all the uh, first aid, aided cases, and, and what have you. Uh, it's called the blotter, and that again goes back in history because when, you, when before you had ballpoint pens and computers, people wrote with fountain pens, and if you wrote with the fountain pen, you had to take uh, you had to take special blotting paper and put it over the print to absorb the excess ink so it wouldn't smear. So this big book where you recorded all the arrest information. Uh, was called the blotter, and because you put it in a book, you were booking the suspect. That's the, the term there. And as this picture shows, not everybody likes to be booked. All right. Then we have the first court appearance. Again, we're talking about pre-trial steps in the process. So after the booking, the person has to be taken to a judge for their first court appearance. And within a few to 48 hours after an arrest, the suspect has to be brought before a judge. And this is for several purposes. First, the person has to be advised of the charges against him or her. Now, this may sound kind of ridiculous because obviously they must know what they were arrested for, but that's not really true. Uh, when I was a police officer, I would sometimes arrest people who were stoned, intoxicated, and they didn't know what they did. In fact, they would wake up in the cell hours later and say, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, only to be shocked at the fact that they were being arrested for, you know, assaulting somebody or trespass or what have you. So 
At this first appearance, the judge is going to make sure that the person arrested knows what the charges are against him or her. They're going to be given their constitutional rights, right to remain silent, right to have an attorney. Uh, they're also going to be assigned an attorney if needed. Uh, in, in our country, you have the right to an attorney anytime you're charged with any kind of criminal activity. And if you can't afford an attorney, the government has to provide you one free of charge. Uh, and that applies any time there's a possibility of incarceration. If you're only going to be confronted with a fine, you don't have a right to a court-appointed attorney. You can hire your own, but you don't have a right to a free one. That's only if you risk incarceration. And finally, the uh, person is before this judge will be given an opportunity to post bail or be released on their own recognizance. And we discussed this earlier in the first part of this lesson. So bail is money or something of value pledged to the court in return for the release of a person accused of a crime. If the person released on bail fails to return to court for his or her next appearance, the money or item of value, maybe a house or a car, goes to the court. So the loss of the money or property is an inducement for the accused to return to court. That's bail. Some jurisdictions also entertain plea bargains at this stage of the process. And a plea bargain is a deal negotiated between the defense attorney and the prosecutor, which has to be approved by the judge, whereby the person pleads guilty, usually to a lesser crime or the same crime, but with a minimum punishment. We call it a plea bargain because it's a good deal, supposedly, for the state which saves the time and money of having to go through a long and lengthy trial process, and the defendant who gets a penalty less than what he or she would have gotten had this gone through the entire process and they were found guilty before a jury. So that's a plea bargain. All right, the next step in this process is the preliminary hearing. And the preliminary hearing is a judicial hearing in which a judge determines, uh, I'm sorry, a judge seeks to determine whether there is probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and the crime occurred within the court's geographical jurisdiction and that the person uh, before the judge, the defendant, committed the crime. So again, this is a routine safety check. Right? A judge has to determine crime was committed within the court's jurisdiction and the person arrested probably committed the crime. And the level of, of, of knowledge, the level of proof which the prosecutor has to establish to the judge is probable cause that these facts are present. So probable cause is that level of knowledge that would lead a, what do you think, reasonable or educated person to believe that some fact is true. Okay, the magic word is reasonable person. Right, so probable cause is that level of knowledge that leads a reasonable person to believe that some fact is true. It's more than a hunch or a suspicion, but it's less than beyond a reasonable doubt or certainty. Probable cause. It, it, it's very common standard throughout the criminal justice system. All right, let's take a little break from the pretrial activities and let's talk a little bit about your Fourth Amendment rights and your freedom. Now, the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it's in the Bill of Rights, states, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This is a foundational principle in American law. Right? You have the right to be safe from government agents, from government agents unreasonably searching or seizing, taking you or your property and effects. So an unreasonable search, of course, could be of you, could be of your home, could be of your storage bin, your briefcase, right? You, the government can search those things, but only when it's reasonable to do so. 
You're also protected against seizure of these things. The government can't seize you, right? Seizing you would be an arrest unless it's reasonable. Nor can they seize your home papers or effects unless it is reasonable. So the question comes up then, when is it reasonable for the government to do these things? And the next half of the Fourth Amendment called the Warrant Clause tells us when that's reasonable. Because the next section of the Fourth Amendment says that no warrants, so we're talking about arrest and search warrants, shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So this tells us exactly when it's reasonable to seize people, seize property, or search people and search property. And it's reasonable when the government agent has probable cause to believe that the person committed a crime or that what's being searched contains illegal goods, contraband, drugs, stolen property, uh, or evidence of a crime. Right? So probable cause is the level for seizing you, arrest, or searching you or your property. Let's actually take a look at a little table. Uh, and the level of knowledge column of the table has the level of knowledge a government agent uh, has connecting you to criminal activity. And it ranges from certainty to beyond a reasonable doubt, to clear and convincing evidence, preponderance of the evidence, probable cause, reasonable fear, reasonable suspicion, all the way down to just a little credible reason. So as you go higher, there's more evidence that you committed a crime. And the other column has the actions, the criminal justice system actions that that particular level of knowledge makes it legal to do. So let's talk about an officer who has a credible reason to think that you're doing something that might be illegal. This is a very low level. You, you don't look like, this doesn't look right. Something's wrong here, right? This person's acting really, really suspiciously, right? So a credible reason, an officer can watch you, can follow you around in a public place, and can even stop you and ask you questions if they have a credible reason to think that you're engaged in criminal activity. Now, keep in mind, uh, watching and following, of course, you might not even know this is happening. But if they stop you and ask you a question, and they only have a credible reason, then they can ask the question, but you don't have to answer. You can say, hey, I'm leaving, goodbye. Uh, that's perfectly legal. Okay, now, the next level of knowledge about criminal activity is reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion is facts and circumstances based upon the training of the police officer that would lead that officer to reasonably suspect that the person is engaged in criminal activity. It is certainly more than a hunch, but it falls short of probable cause that the person's committing criminal activity. In probable cause, the facts would lead the officer to believe that it's more likely than not. It's probable the person's committing a crime. Reasonable suspicion is less than that. It's a ba belief based upon things observed that the officer can articulate in court later on to explain to a judge that made it reasonable to think that there could be a crime occurring here. So if a police officer reasonably suspects that you're engaged in criminal activity, that officer can stop and question you, detain you. So they can stop you and make you stay there and can ask you questions. Now, you still don't have to answer the questions, but you do not have the right to walk away. You can be detained for a brief amount of time uh, to allow the officer to conduct uh, a further on-scene investigation. Although you can't be held for too long. If, if the detention goes beyond maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, it becomes legally problematic uh, if the officer still hasn't got probable cause to arrest you. But reasonable suspicion, more than a hunch, more than a credible reason, but not probable cause. Reasonable suspicion allows an officer to do a stop in question, but you don't have to answer. All right, the next level up is reasonable fear. And this kind of goes along with reasonable suspicion. If you are being subjected to a stop in question, uh, because you're reasonably suspected of committing a crime, if the officer reasonably fears 
that you have a weapon and that you may use it against the officer or somebody else, then the officer has the right to frisk you, pat down the outer layers of your clothing, only delving into a pocket or under a garment if the officer feels something that could be a weapon. Remember, if the officer were going into your pockets and under your clothing, that would be considered a search. And the Fourth Amendment made it clear that to search somebody, you have to have probable cause. In this case, you only have reasonable fear of armed and dangerous. So the Supreme Court said, hey, you can't search because reasonable fear is not probable. It's a lower level of knowledge. But to protect police officers, if they fear it's a weapon that could be used against them or somebody else, we will let you do a less intrusive act, not as intrusive as a full search, but something that could detect a weapon. And that is patting down the outer layers of the garments or and only going under a garment or in a pocket if you feel what could be a weapon and only a weapon. If you feel what could be drugs, you can't go in and lock the person up for drugs because the court carved out this special uh, mini search, semi search to protect cops, not to go on fishing expeditions for contraband. OK, now, if you have more information, if the level of information which the officer has would lead a reasonable person to believe more, it more likely than that, it probable that you committed a crime, then the officer can arrest you and can fully search you. You are allowed to be searched uh, during an arrest because the courts think it's important to seize property that the defendant might uh, destroy or throw away if they weren't searched immediately or weapons that the person might use to escape or harm the police officer. In fact, that brings up a kind of interesting story. Uh, when I was a police officer at Kennedy Airport, I was at one of the airport pre-flight screening um, uh, stations. Uh, and uh, they were uh, the private security people were screening people going through the Mangatamina. And one of the persons went through the Mangatamina and it set off. So they directed him to the back to the other side of the Mangatamina and he emptied his pockets, put them in a little tray and he walked through and the Mangatamina didn't go off. And they handed him the little tray with his possessions. But one of the items in the tray was one of those clamshell uh, women's or, or men's uh, jewelry cases, the kind that you get rings and cufflinks in. They're, they're metal and they open up like a clamshell. They didn't open that. And, you know, that could have contained a Derringer. So, so I walked over and I said, hold on a minute. I said, let's look at that. Well, when it was opened up, inside were a set of works. And now, in, in police and street jargon, a set of works are the drug paraphernalia that heroin users use to inject heroin. In this case, it was a needle, a spoon to cook the heroin, and a little tourniquet to wrap around your arm to make your, your, your veins pop up so you can inject the heroin easily. And of course, uh, that's drug paraphernalia and it is illegal. So I immediately arrested this person uh, for possession of drug paraphernalia. So I have him off to the side up against the wall and I'm attempting to cuff him and then search him. And I suddenly see this really large black guy walking towards me. And I mentioned black guy for an interesting reason. The guy I arrested was also black, by the way. Okay. So, uh, so I'm saying, get back, get back, get back. And, and I'm looking at this big black guy coming towards me because I assume they were together because uh, he's interested in this arrest. They're both black. Right? I mean, little, little clues, right? Not definitive. Uh, but I, keep saying, get back. And he's still like standing close by and I'm looking at him, looking at him and he stops. And I turn around and I finish cuffing this guy. I do a search. I don't find anything on him. Uh, and then uh, the sergeant and backups are there. And so then this other big black guy comes over to us and he says, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm Wilson Pickett. Uh, and Wilson Pickett, for you younger people, was a really popular, you know, big superstar singer in those days. Uh, this flight was on its way from New York to Las Vegas. And he said, uh, and he was a really nice guy, very nice, calm. And he said, uh, that's my drummer. And we're on our way to a gig in Vegas. And I was wondering, uh, you know, how long he'll be detained. Uh, so the sergeant comically turned to Wilson Pickett 
and said, uh, two to five years. Uh, and so, they, you know, and Wilson said, oh, okay, th thank you very much. And, and him and the rest of his band boarded the plane and they did their gig, no doubt, with a replacement drummer in Vegas. Uh, now, the point of this story is, not to tell you my Wilson Pickett story, but the next day I was back there for some other reason and one of the security people said, oh, we threw away the heroin. And I said, what? Uh, they said, oh, yeah. They said, uh, we found packets of heroin on the floor behind the little counter where you were searching him. Uh, and it occurred to me what happened. While I was distracted telling the guy who turned out to be Wilson Pickett to stay back, stay back, I wasn't watching my defendant who hadn't been cuffed yet. And he reached into his pocket, grabbed a bunch of heroin packets and threw the evidence away. And of course, I, I didn't charge him because I did, didn't have the heroin. I probably should have locked up security people, but by then it was even too late to do that. But that shows the reason why police are allowed to search criminals uh, after an arrest, because they will attempt to throw or destroy the evidence. In fact, uh, one of the first things patrol officers in assigned to patrol cars do at the start of a tour is to look behind the rear seats of the patrol car to make sure that there is not guns and contraband stuffed down there by people who were arrested the night before and who were not properly searched. All right, so, uh, probable cause you can arrest and search. Preponderance of the evidence, that's uh, not used too much in criminal law. Uh, that means the majority of the evidence, uh, and it's 51%. And that's the um, level of proof that a civil court jury needs to win for you to win a civil lawsuit. Maybe you're suing somebody for damages or what have you. Uh, clear and convincing is a higher level of proof. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's more than preponderance of the evidence. And that is occasionally used in criminal law and other types of laws. Uh, to give you an example in criminal law, uh, we had a, um, we were considering a bill last year, or well, this year actually, uh, that would have uh, provided for so-called red flag gun seizures. In other words, if, if police thought that somebody was mentally ill, had, had a weapon, was dangerous, the police would be allowed to seize that weapon, uh, even though they don't have probable cause to believe that the person committed a crime, just for the safety. Uh, because you are still infringing on a, fourth, uh, on a first, uh, Second Amendment right, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, the level of proof that the bill had assigned to taking somebody's weapon because they were suspected of being mentally ill and dangerous was uh, above probable cause and it was clear and convincing, a slightly higher level of proof. Because again, you're taking away somebody's constitutional right. The next one up is beyond a reasonable doubt. And you've all heard this, you probably heard it on TV. That is the level of proof necessary to convict a person of a crime at a trial. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and the reason why we say you have to be, be certain that the person committed the crime beyond a reasonable doubt is because there's always some doubt. You can always think of some wild situation where something that as obviously did happen might not have happened or that person didn't do it. So if you said beyond any doubt, you'd never convict anybody. But in this case, we say you can have doubts, but you have to be certain beyond a reasonable doubt. So a wacko doubt, you can still convict just as long as you've gone above the level of reasonable doubt. And certainty means you absolutely positively know it happened. That is never required in any area of the law because it's very hard to be totally certain of anything. So that's an idea of the different levels of knowledge that a government agent can have that you're involved in criminal activity and what level of action is justified, is legal under the Fourth Amendment. Because remember, the magic word in the Fourth Amendment is unreasonable. The Fourth Amendment doesn't protect, doesn't ban the seizure of people, the seizure of property, the searching of people, the searching of property. It only bans that when it's unreasonable. And the Fourth Amendment tells us that probable cause is the magic level of knowledge that makes it legal to arrest people and search people and things, right? That is the anchor of this whole thing. So if you have less than probable cause, you have to do things short of a full arrest and full seizure, like frisking, stopping, questioning, or inquiring or watching, following. If you have information higher than probable cause, like beyond a reasonable doubt, you can put somebody in a prison or a jail.